Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another Ava Interviews. This time we have with me a good friend of mine, uh, as well as a radio host for KRVO 103.1 The River, which, yes, I did have to read directly off my iPad. I, I didn't memorize all the letters. I never know what all the letters in radio stand for. And uh, a fellow voice actor. And also a masterful Pokemon battler. If you've ever played Pokemon Showdown with him, just prepare to lose. Fair warning. He is excellent at it. He is a Pokemaniac, as they say. But kind of going back a little bit earlier in what I uh, pointed him out as a radio host, uh, Miguel does work for a radio station referred to as The River up in Montana. And that ties into what we wanted to talk here today about um, uh, ba basically the basics of radio and being a host and working in that sort of field. So you can kind of consider this maybe uh, the beginning of something uh, like a branch off series from, even though we're called addicted to voice acting, uh, want to explore some other themes, radio, uh, you know, motion capture, other forms of acting, just kind of explore things that are kind of related to it, but not quite the same thing. So that's where we stand today. How are you today, Maget? I'm doing very well, sir. Hope everything's well. Yep, certainly is. It's summer in Florida, so you know it's always humid. And if it starts storming in the middle of this interview, my apologies. That's Florida being temperamental. Unfortunately, not something we, we can. Too, we don't have too much of those problems in Montana. Everything sort of cools down a bit. We do have the fires, so that's like the one drawback. Ah, uh, true. Every state and every area has its its drawbacks and its things you don't want to look for too much. In Florida, it's constantly, oh, yeah. yeah, humidity, hurricanes, a little of this, a little of that. <laughs> hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Good winters are the only thing I've really heard so far. But uh, we wanted to kind of open up this discussion with you, Miguel, about your experiences working for or working with the river as a radio host. As you can no doubt tell by listening in, uh, as at the moment, Miguel has some golden pipes and he puts them to very good use uh, and work in various uh, voiceover roles and for the radio. As a matter of fact, I think you just made a trailer demo. Did you not, Miguel? Um, and that was yeah, I did put it together. We just got signed up with um, a Paradigm Agency in New York City. Wow, nice. That was what uh, that was what got their attention. And it was a wonderful thing to behold, might I tell you. Um, but but focusing today on radio, I thought we might kind of kick this discussion off with first kind of a, st a question of how you personally wound up working in radio. Everybody's going to have a slightly different story of how they got where they are. But before we go delving into other questions of what is this like, what can we expect, what to tell other people who might want to work in radio, just kind of open it up with uh, how you personally got involved with the river, or I guess radio in general. Yeah, certainly. Um, I actually, the thing is that all of it is really a performance for me. I am a voice actor masquerading as a as a radio host right now. Um, radio and voiceover, as you know, are, are two separate you know, entities. And a lot of, you know, I, I'll probably touch on it later, but a lot of voice actors who have started in radio, um, there's a few things that you have to let go of before you go into voiceover as a career because they are two separate things and there are there are two separate sounds and, and different, you know, different things that are going on and things you have to watch out for if you want to cross over. But my origins were back when I was 19 and I just started recording commercials. And I just, I wanted to record some commercials at a local station. It's a tiny little rinky dink station. Like a, it was a tiny little room and I like doing it. So I went to the big radio station out here, which was B broadcasting and told them that I like to record commercials. And so they took me on and just started showing me things. And I was only there for about a year, year and a half. And <laughs> that was when I actually discovered um, anime dubbing and I met Chris Sabat. And so I actually, I left radio. It was more of a kind of a means to an end for me because I didn't want to stay in radio. I didn't want to, that wasn't like a, a lifetime goal or a, a, so much of a passion as it was something that was preparing me for advancement. 
Hmm. And so I, uh, I went back to be broadcasting, which is one of their stations. They have seven stations and it's the, the river is one of them that I actually helped launch back in 2006. And oh, I nice. came back. It's like returning home almost. Yeah. Yeah. For a little while. Um, coming back for a little bit because, you know, they're all people that I was familiar with and it's really hard to find, uh, work out here for someone like me because voiceover is is not it, it's not a thing out here i actually have found that i am i'm the only voice actor in montana and i checked <laughs> wow that, so yeah montana known for open skies and uh roaming fields and then no voiceover unfortunately yeah no voiceover so all of my all the work that i do is very it's it's all from a distance, you know. All of my agents are in other states: California, Illinois, and New York City. Hmm. And uh, so, I have a very difficult time, you know, booking the work. When I go to Burbank, it's a lot easier. But uh, for now, radio radio satisfies my lust to be at the mic, you know, on a daily basis. And I don't have the radio sound, and so. I actually bring voiceover to the table when I'm recording spots or when I'm performing, when I'm on the air. I look at it as a performance, as another role, so as not to distort the two and cross those lines. It's an interesting perspective. Which actually, so yeah, you, you which say makes my performance is much better. Yeah, you say you don't have a, a radio sound. No, I do not. Yeah, I, I feel like with a you know the golden pipes that you have, you would have a voice for pretty much anything. But I guess there's a different kind of connotation or maybe a different kind of expectation from radio that kind of goes hand in hand with that. Yeah. Um, back in the back in the earlier days of voiceover and when it was just getting started with, like, you know, cartoons and everything like that, radio jocks were the guys who went in and recorded the voices. And as the years went on, they started to think, well, you know, these sound great, but what if we what if we changed it? What if we sounded a little bit more? know normal because there's a special saying for radio um it's a term called puking oh and lovely it's it's in reference to the artists or you know the jocks that get on the air and say 103.1 the this that thing you know broadcasting live and it's just this really loud obnoxious sound hmm. puking and the words out how, into the microphone come again as in, like, puking the words out into the microphone, pretty much. Oh, yes, indeed, yes, yes. And that's exactly what it, was, what it was a reference to. It was a very... But it, that used to be the sound. But it, as time went on, it became less and less of a of a craved sound. In fact, there was a, a gentleman, Mark Radway, who um, he used to direct William Shatner and, you know, Tress McNeil down in L.A. before he moved up here to work in radio as well. And he would tell me that um, if you're going to be a voice actor in LA, don't tell them that you're a DJ. He's like, don't do it because it's, they're two separate things and they do not crave that sound. Hmm. Voiceover is very natural. Voiceover is performing. It is being a, you know, it is, it is being different characters. Radio is, is not, is not what that is. So it's very important. And it was good that I learned this early on because I was only there for about a year when I met Chris Sabat and decided I wanted to be an actor instead of a DJ. And so once I knew that, I was very careful about about the way that I sounded. And um, so when I left radio, I just sort of, I stopped it, I wasn't there long enough to have that really integrate into me where that sound was something I did. Because if you go and you listen to the gentlemen that are working there now, they all have a distinct sound, and that's their sound. And when they try to, to go to perform, that's what they bring to the table. And so in their element, it's perfectly fine, and it's perfectly wonderful, and they're very talented individuals. But in order to cross over, after about, you know, if you do it for a couple of years, that's a sound that gets pretty locked in. And so if you aspire to voiceover, definitely dedicate to it. If you want to dedicate to radio, it's a wonderful company. It's, it's a, a business. It's, a, it's changing a lot. 
for sure. It's definitely changing. It's not the way it used to be. But, you know, if you want to do both, it's kind of difficult if you're looking to perfect your performance skills, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we're definitely hearing some good nuggets of advice from the, the early minutes of this interview. First and foremost, there is definitely a, a separation of sorts between voiceover and radio. They're not automatically the same thing, even though it's similar sorts of environments. Again, microphones, sound teams, uh, soundboards, engineers, but definitely not exactly the same thing. And I guess you have to know where which direction you want to go in and where you want to draw the line, rather than assuming that what works in one works in the other. Exactly. Hmm. Now, what sorts of, uh, like you've kind of discussed, it sounded like for you, it started with a question going into radio, like, uh, can I work with you guys? Here's what I can bring to the table. So for you, radio kind of started with that question. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of lucky, you know, when I look back at it, because I was 19 and and to be frank, I was terrible. I, uh, I I didn't. I loved to I loved to, to to act, so to speak. But I had never performed anywhere. I had never been. I never had a had had a, had a job before. I didn't know. I didn't do voiceover. Didn't have an agent. Didn't have anything. So when I went in there, I was just recording, and I would try to lower my voice to hit you know deeper pitches, and it was a pitch I just didn't possess, and so it sounded forced for sure and so with you know when i when they when they brought me on i was 19 i think the thing is that the ceo was he just kind of uh, i reminded him of himself and he brought me on and they just started showing me things They're like you like this don't you get you like all this i'm like yeah i like all this look at all these look at all these buttons look at all these switches and all the glass walls well that would put me in heaven so it was yeah, it was very exciting to me. And so I started doing things and it was it was an environment that I wasn't prepared to be in. And so you know, I left relatively early after I started, you know, and had a lot of you know, I I'd made some mistakes and I had a lot of, you know, learning to do. But during that time is when I discovered what I really wanted. So it was an integral part of of my advancement as a, you know, as, as a VA. Hmm. So there is some sort of connection between the two, just in terms of performing and learning how to find your style and your voice. But I guess the trick is learning where to divide them and where to spend your time and your energy. Certainly. Yes. I would definitely suggest anyone who desired to do both begins, begins in voiceover because then it's, it's the same as it would be if you had started a radio and spent many years in it. I have a friend who, he was in radio with me. He started about maybe six months after I did. We were both very fresh, very new. And he stayed in radio for about five years. And there is a definitive difference in the way we sounded post-radio, moving on into voiceover. And it took him a lot of years, about... I want to say six, about six years to, to shed the radio sound from his auditions. Wow, it's pretty noteworthy. So, yes, definitely. And there, we have another gentleman, a, friend of, a mutual friend of ours, who's been in radio for 14 years. And he will never get out of that sound. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a negative thing because he's excellent at what he does. But in order to transition into performing... There's, an, there's a few things you have to untrain your voice in, and that can be very difficult, and it can take years to undo. That's not saying that radio is bad, because it's not. It's a great place you know, to, to, you know, it, it's just a fun place to work, first and foremost. Um, and then there's a whole lot of different dynamics and commercial production, and if you like doing production, that's a great place to do it. Being on the air, the recognition, you know, when people recognize your voice in the, in the town, wherever you're performing. And so it's excellent, but it's difficult to, it's difficult to do both unless you've been, unless you've started in voiceover first. Hmm. A fair point to make. Um, I have often read and heard about kind of the struggles of 
crossing over from, you know, theater acting to voice acting, or in this case, radio to voice acting, or even voice acting to something else. So there, there are things that are intrinsic to each category that are kind of hard, hard to unlearn once you're there. Right. Now, uh, also kind of uh, doing some little... Uh, radio is definitely something I've given some thought to. In fact, some people have kind of, uh, not working in radio, but people have kind of approached me asking if working in radio is a possibility for me. Um, it, it definitely looks like there are some expectations uh, that either you could have or should have, or maybe depending on the job you must have um, before gaining certain roles in the radio industry. So uh, approaching that perspective, and of course, knowing your kind of a unique story behind that um what sort of background slash skills slash credentials uh would one or should one have in order to get into radio in order to be in that seat behind the microphone uh being the voice on the air the, a lot of the time it's you've been to rate you've been to broadcast school there are broadcast schools um, they're kind of rare these days because, like I was saying earlier, radio is definitely changing. Um, it's moving digital into the digital age here. Um, we're a little behind in some places, and it's, in a lot of ways, it's a dying breed. And that's why they've had to evolve and change the way we approach radio. And, but for someone who wants to do it, often, I think I got lucky because I'm in a smaller town. And I just, it was luck of the draw, knowing someone, which is, you know, in entertainment, as you found, is that, you know, it's the who you know, oftentimes trumps just about anything. And, but in this instance, I would recommend going into your local radio station. I would go in and give them a demo. because They want to hear the demos. If you can show, if you can showcase that you can do the work, putting together your air checks, putting together demos, showing off your production skills, then, I mean, that would be, that, that's where I would start. Okay, I'm assuming that these, these demos are going to be separate from voiceover demos, of course. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt showing them, though. Because the thing is that even though I'm, I'm telling you that they're different, the, the, the drawback to that is, that other people, people in radio, um, you know, people in general, the general public, don't know that they're different or don't think that they're different. Um, and that's that's both, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You know, it's like, well, on one hand, you can show them your excellent voiceover work and they're like, oh, this is really great. You should be on the radio. But then on the other side, when you're giving local people rates for voiceover work separate from your radio work, they don't understand why the rates are so high. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a drawback. I've run into those issues. Hmm. So uh, you're saying kind of uh, go into the radio station and talk to them, show them what you can do. So definitely build a connection there. You know, um, build a connection. Yeah. And in your case, was that something where you just kind of uh, was it something you set in advance where you would meet with these people, or did you just kind of walk in and start asking questions? That was literally what I did. When I was 19, I walked in, and I asked questions, and they introduced me to the program director, and they liked me enough to bring me on and show me everything that they knew. The innocence of youth pays off. Exactly. It was, that, it was just like that. So definitely take a chance. I'm finding that that really is kind of the crux of entertainment in general when you're marketing and networking it's like you said it's not so much following the correct formula as it's a matter of expanding your horizons meeting new people so the new person you met who you think may not really have anything to do with your career per se could actually wind up taking you to higher places and teaching you something new exactly and it's it's just like it is in voiceover you know it's there's no one right way to do it it's your own journey, and the way that you do it is the way that you do it. As long as you don't, as long as you don't give in or give up, and you know, continue to knock on those doors. And there were plenty of years 
in the interim, you know, be, you know, between things where I had to perfect my skills and don't stop perfecting the skills. I've done weird stuff. I've I've been the voice of the of you know the you know, IVR systems or instructional videos and e-readers, e-learners um, in other countries teaching uh, third world countries how to speak English and work for American Express and I've, I've been a DJ for, for a radio station down in uh, Wichita where I, I recorded from a closet and they have no idea. You know, there's just, I've produced weird podcasts that, you know, about fountain pens <laughs> an assortment of odd things that all kind of steered in the direction of where I wanted to be. Hmm. Don't keep, or rather don't stop knocking on doors. Don't stop knocking on doors. Don't don't stop doing the thing that you love, and and if you love it, you'll bleed for it. And yeah. And the thing is, is that it pays off in time. It does. Yeah. Slow going, but more and more, uh, the more momentum you pick up, the easier it's going to be down the road. But it could take years to get there. Precisely, and and I'm looking at about 13 years here of pursuits, and when we were speaking last year is astronomically different of what what I'm doing, you know, a year hence. You know, here here we are right now and I'm finally at that point where everything is changing. Where I'm finally actually really segueing into the work that I love, doing the work that I love, and people are coming to me and I'm finally actually I'm getting the work now and I'm I'm getting involved in film and animation and it's actually it's finally happening and it, it took it took over a decade, though. Yeah. It's not always going to so, go the way you envision, but if you keep at it, it'll take you somewhere. Precisely, and it's very rarely what you imagine, but it's always better. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned the divide, and we've talked about it quite a bit, about between voiceover and radio, how they're kind of different beasts. But working for radio, on the flip side of the coin, would you say that there may be certain... Uh, skills or techniques that might help a voice actor or uh, like a knowing how to work a this particular piece of equipment or knowing how to engage the audience in this way or this kind of voice etc cetera, etc cetera. um to be honest with you there's not many and the reason for that is because we are catering to a different type of type of performance in radio we're keeping people excited for listening to our music and buying and buying the products. And you know, obviously you want to be engaging, but in voiceover, voiceover covers such a wide span of, of, of slight nuances. And while you can pay attention to those nuances in radio, and that's why I said being in voiceover first and translating over to radio definitely makes your job stand out. It makes your work really stand out. And that's the kind of reactions that I get personally because it's like, wow, who did that spot? And sometimes they don't even know it's me. And as a radio guy, you can pick out certain, you can pick out certain people and you can say, hey, that's, that's this guy. That's him. That's how he sounds all the time. And so that's why I was saying I kind of masquerade as a jock because sometimes you can play with the mic and be like, oh, I'm going to be someone completely different. In terms of radio preparing for voiceover, what it did for me is what I would, was what I would offer. And what it did for me is it got me to learn how to, to speak louder, to lose that self-awareness that you get when you first start, you know, speaking in front of a microphone. Um, when you're self-aware, you, you know, you tend to overreact or overact and, you know, as a better word for it, you overact when you're self-aware because you're trying to self-correct. You're trying to adjust your voice and you're trying to change it. And so all of those things that, you know, that you do when you first start, you know, when you first hear your voice played back to you and I got through all of that in radio. And so, and that's the other that's the other thing about the difference between the two is that when you're speaking, um, radio is very self-aware. You're 
your your job is to be self aware of what you're saying and what you're doing. And it's not that voiceover doesn't do that, but it's in such a way that we're not doing it for performance sake. We're doing it for clarity's sake. And so a lot of the emotional connection can be lost when you're performing on the air. It's not about emotion. It's about talking about the product or talking about the, the event. Whereas in voiceover, you become someone else entirely and you do different things and you're, and you're performing, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So definitely uh, what you're saying about radio is that it kind of helps break you into getting past the awkward stage at the very least. So while there are maybe different skills and different techniques, it helps break you in. Yes. Yes. It's, it gets, it breaks, it can break you of the, you know, the nervousness of being behind a microphone. Hmm. So if there's a radio station in any listener's town or in their interest in radio, uh, but maybe they're not too far in the voiceover careers yet, or maybe they haven't even started. Uh, might not be a bad idea just to ask around then. Definitely. Now, of what you, heard. yeah, uh, of what you've learned in radio, there being that difference between the the two the two areas, uh, would you say what would you say would be the most important for radio specifically, like the most important skills or mindsets or things to bring to the table? That would make you happy and successful working in radio. In order to be successful and happy in radio, it's good to definitely be yourself. And I don't mean that in terms, in, you know, in, you know loosely, in a, in, a, in a loose way. It's like, just be yourself. It's just, it's, it's a real thing. If you're relaxed at the microphone, then people will hear it. And they're more apt to listen to you if you, if you come across as... If you're stiff and you're nervous, you know, all that translates as well. And okay. it's good to wear multiple hats in radio. Yeah. Um, the skill sets, you won't go in and do only one thing. You'll want to go in and anticipate cutting commercials, doing production, doing what's called RDS, you know, you're, which is where you're just actually <laughs> retyping band names and um, artist names to come up on the face plates in people's cars on their radios. Um, there's a whole assortment of engineering things and you know issues and stuff. There's a few things in there that I don't know how to do. Um, I'm more on the production side, production, on air stuff, and you know creating relationships between local, you know local uh, local brands companies who come in and record spots for their uh for you know for their products or their or their restaurants you know so it's it's a lot of fun when you're interacting with people and and it's a lot of fun when you can just sort of work and do your thing and and there's not someone constantly breathing down your neck and that's what radio offers you know there's 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 a lot of freedom in it there's a lot of, you know, oh, I'm expressing, you can, you can be expressive and, and do your own thing and, and, you know, and they pay you for it and you're on the air and you're doing a thing and it's exciting. It really is good to hear a job that really offers a lot of satisfaction back to people who, like you said, uh, want that experience of kind of relaxing, being themselves, uh, and not the typical work environment of reporting to a supervisor or, uh, you know, adhering to a bunch of rules, but kind of uh, a more laid back atmosphere. Right. I mean, especially in smaller towns, the bigger markets can be a little different, but yeah. Now I had kind of a, uh, kind of an interesting thing I wanted to run by you. Uh, I know a lot of people may be curious, of course, this goes for a lot of different careers and fields of voiceover included, but for radio, I wanted to kind of ask you what would a, quote unquote, typical day at a radio station look like from the time you get your head off the pillow to the time you uh, finish up working at the radio station and go home, you know, what kind of process might you go through? What might that look like? For me, it's very simple. I, um, I'm not a morning person, so I sleep in and, uh, (laughs) I control my own hours Because as long as you're hitting the marks and where you need to be and getting the work done, at least in my scenario, they don't mind too much when you're coming in. No one's 
standing at the door, tapping their foot, waiting me to waiting for me to come in and clock in. So when I, you know, when I get up and I'm doing my thing, get through my own morning routine, when I finally get to work, I have a stack of production. You know, sometimes, sometimes I don't have a whole lot at all, but, you know, there's other days where you can have quite a bit. And this includes new updates on weathers, commercials that need to be cut, um, barters, spots that need to be, you know, put into the system. And uh, I just, I take it upstairs. We have the sales team that's on the bottom floor. And then up on the top, we've got all the jocks and all the on-air folk. And they're all doing, we're all doing very different things. They're doing their own shows. They're doing their own interviews. And uh, I head to my favorite production room, which is nostalgic for me because it reminds me of when I was there, you know, over a decade ago. I've only been back for about maybe about four or five months. So I go in and I put in my daily weathers and do the updates and go around the each station and put all the new the new breaks into the weather books, um, updated copy. If I have a uh, if I have a piece of production to record, I'll do it earlier in the day so that we can get approval on it. And then I'll probably end up doing barters, and that's something I'll be doing today, which is what we get in trade, where we take these national spots and we put them into our own system. But they all have to be paired. So this is where production skills come in. You have to do do a uh, 60 second spots. So you need to take two 30s and just splice them together and save them down. Good news is, is we we run Adobe Audition. Uh, CS6, so it's a really good program. So it keeps everything moving smoothly and moving fast. It's not no longer splicing and taping like it was you know, in the earlier days. But at that point, it's probably when I go and do my show, I'll go in and I'll record the first few breaks. You know, it's what's called voice tracking. And I'll record the first couple of breaks so that I can go back and do anything else that I've you know, forgotten to do, which gives me another, you know, another hour. Four breaks in an hour. I can record all of them in the first few minutes and put them in where they're supposed to go. And then I might go back to, you know, something else. Or I'll just do the entire show. And then uh, when I'm finished with that, it's just a matter of making sure that the logs are in for the following day. Make sure all the music and all the commercials are, are starting at 5 a.m. on the nose. And then there's just a small assortment of things that someone might come in and ask me to do, like put in a special spot or take on a client and record them. And uh, most of the time I find myself doing production, I'll find, I'll either, you know, put on some music. And we got the great, we got great monitors in there. So the speakers are, are solid. So I'll listen to music, I'll crank up. You know, metal, which is what I like to listen to. Some hard it's rock. the way to do it. And I'll just start, <laughs> I'll just play it and I'll just get lost in my zone. And the hours go by really fast for me. Um, it's not a stressful job for me. I don't go home and, and go, oh my God. <laughs> Gotta <laughs> get up and do it what again. A terrible day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just, I'm excited about it. When I'm at work, I'm excited to be there. You know, it's, it's a, uh, it allows me to, it satisfies, you know, my, my mic lust. And, you know, when I need to be in front of a microphone, when I'm not booking. And the good news is if I get auditions, you know, and I do get them, you know, I can record them there and send them off. It's an unexpected perk. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a good, it's a good gig. You know, I enjoy doing it. It's a, it there's a lot of changes that are being made in radio right now. And, you know. I might, you know, my job might change, you know, you know, soon. I'm not sure how soon, and I'm not sure how long I'll be there. But, uh, you know, I have, but it's a good place to be. It's a good place to be where I'm at right now. Hmm. So it sounds like most of your work is um, not necessarily live or certainly not always on the microphone, but you do a variety of things, and you certainly do put yourself in front of that microphone uh, fairly often to satisfy, as you said, your yeah. mic lust. It's a heck of a term to use. I have to use that in the future. <laughs> Microphone. Mike lust. lust. 
many different ways it could be interpreted. Um, uh, of course, going back to, as ever, the divide, which we've gone over between voiceover and radio, uh, we've gone over skills and what you can expect and what you can't expect. But um, are there various things that being in radio, you can say, put on your portfolio to maybe or your resume to kind of show off to various studios or production companies or uh, different people you can meet. And I'm sure there's some here and there. But like you said, uh, how would you put it? Don't don't sell yourself as a DJ to like a studio or a director. And it's a different sort of. Absolutely. Yeah, don't cross Absolutely. the streams. That's like saying that's like going into a dentist's office and promoting yourself as a an audio engineer. There, you know, you can you can go. You say, "Hey, we're working with our mouths." <laughs> that is we, true, we, I we guess. Work with our mouth. <laughs> it's they're they're related, yes, and and I understand. And and there's there is a lot of confusion that that goes with it sometimes because people are like. When they hear your voice, I'm sure you've gotten this many, many times. Because I hear your voice, and I and I and I melt. So if you're, you're out in oh, public, thanks, and, and someone someone listens to you talking, they're like, "Hey, you should be on the radio." And so that's a joke, you know, between me and my friends. We're always like, they do a thing. He's like, "You should put that on the radio." And that's what people's immediate response is, because radio used to be, you know, that was. That was the thing. That was where everything came from. That was, you know, because radio was before television. You know, so I'm in no way, I am in no way, you know, dissing or bashing on radio. But what I am, what I am doing is identifying that there, they are, they are separate. There are similarities in terms of, you know, we're we're all performing and we're doing things and we're 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 you know we're promoting, we're doing that kind of stuff. And there are certainly different forms of voiceover that can translate better into radio or vice versa, like, you know, promotional reads, you know, and things of that nature. But the, uh, in terms of bringing it to the voiceover table, I, I wouldn't, I personally, I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't tell a client, a potential client or an agency or another, you know, company, a, a trailer house or an animation studio that I worked in radio because oftentimes um, <laughs> it was referred to me, the guy who told me this, he said, uh, he's like, they call it the kiss of death. And you're like, the kiss of death. I'm like, wow, that sounds really dramatic, right? And the thing is, is that it just, it, it kind of, I don't know if it puts people off but it just makes them think, oh, okay, you're a radio guy. You have this sound. Don LaFontaine himself, uh, a friend of he wrote a he wrote a letter to a friend of mine who lives up here, um, and he was uh, he, he, he was a radio guy trying to break into voiceover, and he sends his work down to Don, and Don sent him a letter back. He's like, well, Eric, you're a radio guy, and and I was he's like, that's that's where it starts. And he's like, if, and he, he gave them the tips on, on how to, on how to break out of that, if that was truly his desire. So, um, so in terms of bringing it, bringing it over, um, I, you know, I probably would keep that as a separate entity of yourself. It's not a bad thing. It's just different. Okay. So you can definitely make connections with people, but in terms of promoting yourself and putting that on resumes, Definitely a better idea to keep those two things separate. If you're trying to go into voiceover, yes. Yeah. Now, what else might be different between, obviously, there are going to be a lot of things, but in terms of simple things like speaking into the microphone, the people you work with, what are some things that stick out to you as being really different between voiceover and radio? Uh, because, obviously, you, you may go into... Uh, the recording room in your uh, radio station and uh, do the work that's kind of been assigned to you. Uh, but, of course, the microphone technology is probably going to be different. The recording process is going to be different. Uh, who's in there with you, working with you, is probably going to be a little bit different. Uh, so just kind of uh, going down this list of what's similar and what's different between the two. Sure. Um, in radio, there's no director except for you. You're the director. Um, you are the director, you are the engineer, you are the production man. Um, and 
voiceover, you are the performer, and most, and usually that's it. And you know, you go if you're recording, you got a you got an engineer at the board, you got a director, you might have the client in there, you might have some other people in there that you know didn't know anything about, and in radio, it's just you. You go in there and you do the work, and there's no, uh, you know, tip. there are people listening. There's always someone listening, but there's no, uh, how do I say, um, there's no one sitting there um, that that approves your commercials. I mean, I said earlier with approval, you get it. They send the spot to the client in radio. Once I record it and send it in, um, they send it to the client. They're like, yeah, you like that? And they're like, yeah, I like that. And then, you know, and that's, and that's the approval. If they don't like it, it's typically something like set a word wrong, set a name wrong, and that's why it's always good to check first. And um, but for the most part, you kind of do everything in radio as opposed to voiceover, where there's separate people doing all of these separate things. Hmm. An interesting nuance that I think uh, a lot of people probably aren't necessarily aware of. Like you said, a lot of people don't necessarily know how radio or even voiceover work. Uh, they mean, hey, you've got a great voice for radio. You should go in there. But, you know, there's still a lot of mystery surrounding it. Right. And it's nice. You know, there's a there's a certain sense of anonymity in voiceover. You know, they hear your voice, and but they don't know your face. You know, <laughs> and they're like, oh, here's the You're guy. You're a mystery. This, you know, there's this normal person. Then you talk, and they're like, oh, my God, wait a minute. I know that voice. Now, kind of wrapping up here, um, what are some of, I mean, we've mentioned before, or we've gone over before, you've said that working in radio is very pleasurable. You don't go home going, oh, I have to get up and do this tomorrow. Oh, I don't feel like going in today. And of course, there are going to be you know good days and bad days. But you've overall mentioned it as a great experience for someone who has that mic lust or uh, wants to break into some sort of avenue where they can entertain. But I guess a better way of phrasing this question would be, who is it not for? Uh, who would think they want to get into radio and then go into and discover, oh, this isn't what I thought it was? You know, what are some of the hardships and challenges that people don't think about? Hardships and challenges in radio, I would have to say that if you're looking, hmm, that's an interesting one. I think it's for people that aspire to other things and and don't know how to get in. I mean, I suppose that would be the, the case with anything that you're trying to break into. But it can also be location. Like for me, you know, in order to break into voiceover, it's I can't do it here. I have to do it other places. Um, sometimes when, you know, an executive decision is made and, you know, you – and you want to do a spot a certain way, you can't because there's a constraint on it because the client doesn't want something a certain way. I've had that happen before where I had this, you know, I made a, you know, I made a commercial that was really solid and the client didn't like the sound because it made them nervous or something of that nature. So sometimes it can just be as simple as your work, um, you know, not being usable. And where they're like, no, this is not what we want. Um, like I said, I don't, uh, I don't really have a whole lot of. Oh my God, this is this is terrible. There's a thing called barters, and barters, like I was explaining earlier, are time consuming. And sometimes, if you allow some of your tasks to accumulate into a certain day, you do have to space it out. Otherwise, you will have a million and one things to do in one day, and very little time to, you know, to do it. So that's that's one issue that I had to get you know get a grip on, where I'm like, all right, this is Monday, and on Monday I do this, and Tuesday I do this, and so on and so on, so that by Friday I'm not going nuts <laughs> trying to figure out how to get everything done. But even then, even then, it's still kind of like a fun rush. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm rushing around trying to do a thing, and it's satisfying still. Yeah, the thrill of being busy, not yeah. overworked, but busy. Busy. Yes, very busy. Yeah. So I'm kind of getting from this, you 
want to have a strong sense of self-motivation. So in other words, if you're the kind who has to be told you must do this then or you must come in then, then they probably might find it a little bit harder. Or would that be kind of a correct oh, yeah. assumption? <laughs> yes, definitely. If, if you're a if you're a self-starter, it's a good spot. If you need to have someone constantly, you know, telling you, giving you instructions and, you know, I'm not, I'm talking about things that are beyond the learning curve and, and, and learning things. Um, if you just need someone to be like, oh, here's the thing, and you know where the boss is, and you talk to the boss, you're like, well, now go do this. No, that's, that's, that is not going to work out in radio. You definitely want to have your own sense of, your own sense of purpose and your own sense of, you know, your own drive. And I'm like, okay, I got to do these things and take on the tasks and do more, do everything they give you, do everything. And when you do everything and then you learn how to do it efficiently, there was a time where I used to do things where that would take me several hours because it was new, but now it takes one hour to do three or four things because it's just, you'd learn to become efficient and you're just, you just get faster. So yeah. So yeah, be a self-starter, be motivated. Um, obviously, if you have problems projecting or kind of, I guess, relaxing when trying to entertain or be behind a microphone, uh, it's either something you have to break past of or acknowledge that maybe it's not for you. But as you said earlier, radio can help you move past that if you really uh, learn how to, I guess, get past yourself. Oh, yeah, definitely. Radio and any performance of any kind. You have to really get out of the way. You know, you can't uh, just kind of have to let go because people can hear it. People can hear if you're nervous. They can hear if you're, you know, if you're tense. And those aren't necessarily emotions, you know, that you want to have when you're when you're trying to entertain. Yeah, definitely comes through in the recording. So we've learned a lot of things in discussing this with you, Miguel, about. Uh, like how, how to get into radio and what you're expected to do. Uh, just start asking around is really what you said. It's how you, you literally just walked in and kind of asked, what can I do, right? <laughs> yeah, back when I was 19 years ago. Yep. It was a little different this time around, but yeah. <laughs> so try new things, make connections. Even if somebody says no, or not right now, or we want you somewhere else, it's good to at least try if it's something that you're interested in or passionate about. Certainly. And we've spoken extensively that there is a divide of sorts between voiceover and radio. How there are certain things that are similar, but also a lot of things where they don't just don't mingle. Uh, you can be, you can spend 10 to 20 years in radio, but that doesn't automatically mean that momentum will carry over to voiceover. And there are certain things you will have to relearn, in essence, between the two. Abs yeah, absolutely. A, a 10, a 20 year man will have a very difficult time breaking into voiceover. It, it's a very, yes, they'll have, they'll have a very difficult time because that would mean that they're, they're used to so many different, different ways, you know, and I, I've spoken to people that are 20, 30 year men who want to get into voiceover and they, they, their methods for getting in are, are, they're not, uh, their assumptions on how to get in are, are incorrect because they don't know what the process is in voiceover. So they asked me, how do I do this? Well, I can, I can send, I can send you this and I can give you this. I'm like, well, actually it's not me. You want to go through these people. You want to go through an agency. You want to build a demo. You want to do these things. And their work is going to sound very radio and, and it should, because that's what they're good at. That's what they do. Yeah. But yeah, definitely a 20 year man will have a, a very difficult time. Yeah. Unless, of course, you are playing a radio host, but you may not want to hold on to that hope that that's the only <laughs> job you get. Not many of those auditions floating around. I've seen one in my entire career as a, as a VA. One right. audition as a radio guy, and it was for Fallout. <laughs> and wouldn't that be perfect? Yep, almost booked it. Now, when you say Fallout, you're talking about like the the main series games, or was this like a DLC or a mod yeah. kind of thing? Fallout Four. Wow. So you, you said you kind of got closer to that role. Yeah, Fallout Four and Far Cry Five were my most recent games where I was like kicking myself, going, "Oh my gosh, I was so close." Yeah, we know that feeling once we 
you put in the time in the voiceover industry, you learn to go, uh, especially roles that are closer to, um, not able to say too much, but I'm scripting for a video game right now called Welcome to the Clearing, and which means that I'm kind of writing about characters, uh, and that is my function within, within the game for the most part, but there are also opportunities to potentially voice some of the characters, little auditions opening up and talks here and there. And of course, these are the characters that I've written. Now I'm closer to them. How, would, how do I get out of my own way? And after you send the audition, you're like, I should have done something different. Why did I do that? Uh, I just wish I could take them back. But of course, that is the struggle. Right. Uh, we've gone over, of course, the ins and outs of what radio looks like. How it's a very kind of self-started, self-motivated, um, to some extent working on your own, or at least being able to do a lot of the things on your own, speaking in front of the microphone, being the director or the engineer of your own uh, work for that day. And we... Absolutely. Yeah. And from what you're saying, it's it's an excellent job for people who want to uh, express themselves in some format to entertain if they have a microphone lust. You know, that's an excellent thing to try out for. Um, so long as they're aware of the two or how it's separate from other kinds of entertainment. Certainly. Yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, I mean, more and more it's something I'm starting to think about too, so who knows? You never know what could happen. But uh, I'm, I'll probably be sure to like write a little list of bullet points of various things here and there that people can take away. But I think we've learned quite a bit about um, how you got into radio, uh, what they can expect working in radio, what they should have, what they shouldn't expect. Um, and that's turned this into a very fruitful discussion. So I want to thank you very much, Miguel, for coming with me on today. We'll have to battle Pokemon later. I promise you I'll win. I'll probably break that promise, but hey. <laughs> Just like we said, you never know unless you try. To it with great gusto. And I will eventually beat you with my Kabutops. Favorite Pokemon. Well, that's something that we need to see. I feel like I almost made it happen once. Like there's some sort of setup. There was there actually was a time where you got really close because of that that, that stack you had, but yeah, it was um it was close. It was close. I remember. One of these days. <laughs> My own personal Pokemon rival. But anyway, I think we're about to sign off for this interview. So I want to thank you very much, we get one more time for uh coming on board and having this discussion about radio and what we can expect. I appreciate you having me. All right. Fair winds, good sir. <laughs>